So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, tonight is the next installment of the Our Planet, Your Biosphere event series that we're running all through November. And tonight we're going to be talking about upland habitats with Mary Toomey, who is the project ecologist from the Mikulikudi Reeks EIP project. Um, so hopefully you can all hear me okay. And there should be a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So if you have any questions as we're going along, you can type them in there and we'll try and get to them. And um, both Mary and Patricia will be here to answer questions at the end as well for a few minutes. Uh, just a big shout out and a thank you to our funders for the event, Creative Ireland Kerry and the EPA. They've been very generous in helping us get these events off the ground. So we're very grateful for that. So just to start off with, uh, I'm going to run through a few slides about the Kerry Biosphere Reserve. So the UNESCO Kerry, I should introduce myself first, I suppose. My name's Eleanor Turner, in case you haven't seen me before. And I'm the new, recently appointed Biosphere Officer working on the UNESCO Kerry Biosphere Reserve with South Kerry Development Partnership. So biosphere reserves are about nature conservation, but not just about nature conservation. They always center around a core area that is usually a protected area for specific habitats or species. Um, but they're also to do with how we use that land. So how we make our livelihoods there, the businesses that operate in the area and how we might use the area for recreation. So they're really about how those things interact. So we like to say that biosphere reserves are where nature and culture intersect. UNESCO, of course, hopefully you all know, is the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. I get asked that a lot to explain what it is, so now you'll, you'll know for sure for the next pub quiz, if we, <laughs> when we have pub quizzes again. And where is the Kerry Biosphere Reserve? So loosely put, it's around the centre of Kerry here. It takes in the Killarney National Park, is the core area, and the buffer and transition zones take in area around the McGillicuddy Reeks and over into the Paps on the eastern side of the county. Here's a closer up map of the Kerry UNESCO Biosphere Reserve with the zones marked out. So the core zone is our protected area in the centre and it takes in all of Killarney National Park. The buffer zone then incorporates some of the McGillicuddy Reeks areas and over into the Paps on the eastern side. And then the transition zone is around that outside again and this is where you see most of the human activity. So today we're going to be talking mostly about the e McGillicuddy Reeks EIP project area, which is obviously open in the McGillicuddy Reeks. So we'll join Mary, who is sitting in front of some beautiful mountains with us this evening, and she's going to talk a little bit more about the habitats that you can find up there and about the work she does with the project. So I'll stop sharing my screen, Mary. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Eleanor. So um, I'm actually just going to share my screen quickly now as well. Um, okay. So good evening everyone. As Elmer said, um, I'm the project ecologist for the McGillicuddy Reeks European Innovation Partnership Project or EIP as we call them. Um, and we are basically, an EIP is basically an agri-environmental project. Um, and there is over, there's about 23 of them in the country and there's um, five upland EIPs. So we are basically focusing in the McGillicuddy Reeks. Um, there's myself, uh, our project manager Patricia Dean who's listening in tonight and um, we have a part-time administration officer as well. So um, what I'm going to talk to you tonight about really is that the habitats that we find in the McGillicuddy Reeks, why the habitats are important. Um, the area has been designated as a special area of conservation, which is a European nature conservation designation, that I'll go into in a little bit more detail. So we're going to look at why, why the habitats are important, um, what, um, why the, the, the SAC was set up to protect them and then we're going to talk a little bit about the types of animals and plants that you find in the habitats and then the work that our project is doing to try and conserve the, these habitats. So, um, so just to say I, I work for South Kerry Development Partnership and our the IP also we have an operational group and we have a number of partners on the operational group um, from National Parks and Wildlife Services, I teach early, um, some participant farmers, um, agricultural advisors, TAGAS, um, who else? Have I left anyone out? Is there... I think uh, Kerry County Council as Kerry well. Kerry Council as well. So, yeah. Consultants. Yeah. yeah, so, so that, that's all our partners as well that we're working with. So, um, so as most of you will know, the McGillicuddy Reeks are the highest mountain range in Ireland. And has Ireland's highest mountain, Karen Tool. Um, 
They're also really popular for tourism. There are um, a lot of people visit them for hill walking and climbing, um, but they are all privately owned. So um, if you look at this picture here in the fore foreground, there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of hill walkers in the foreground, but in the background, there's little white dots and they're all sheep. So the McGillicuddy Reeks are primarily sheep farming areas. So they are actively farmed at the same time, even though they provide a huge recreational resource as well. Um, so the, the red line here shows the core area that we're working in, um, which is basically the, the McGillicuddy Reeks, the central area. Um, so this is part of the Killarney National Park, McGillicuddy Reeks and Cara River Catchment Special Area of Conservation. Now, the Special Area of Conservation is actually a lot larger than the area that we're working in. So it does extend east into Killarney there, it extends out to the west and down to the south. Um, but the area that we're working in, the majority of, majority of it is within the Special Area of Conservation. There are some, some sites on the lower grounds that fall just outside the boundary of the Special Area of Conservation. So um, just to tell you a little bit about how Special Areas of Conservation came about, um, there's two pieces of European legislation that are really important for protecting wildlife. And this is the Birds Directive and the Habitats Directive. So the Birds Directive came first back in 1979 and its objective really was to protect rare, threatened and migrating birds across Europe. So under the directive, um, member states had to set up special protection areas or SPAs as they're called um, to protect these bird species. Um, then the Habitats Directive then came many years later in 1992 and its aim was to protect rare, um, rare and threatened habitats and species species other than birds really because the birds had already been quite well covered and under the habitats directive then we had to set up what's called these special areas of conservation so together the special protection areas and the special areas of conservation formed a network of protected sites across europe um, and it's often called the natura 2000 network um, so in the directives then it, there's annexes at the back of the directive that list the species and habitats which we have to set up these um, sites or establish these sites for. So often you'll hear these species being referred, referred to as protected species or annex species. So just to give you an idea then, um, this is a list of the annex habitats that we have in the special area of conservation here where the McGillicuddy Reeks is focused. So the Killarney National Park, McGillicuddy Reeks and Cara River Catchment, SAC. So there's actually 14 habitats listed there. So SACs are usually designated for a few habitats and a few species at the same time. So we're not going to go through all these habitats in detail, but just to say that we'll focus on some of the peatland habitats tonight, like the dry heath, the wet heath, um, the upland blanket bogs and the um, alpine and subalpine heaths. So uh, other habitats that you would find in our, in our area within the McGillicuddy Creeks would be the oligotrophic waters containing very few minerals. So they, a lot of the water bodies up in the reeks would fall under that category. Um, and then some of the habitats would lie outside of the area that we're working in, for example, the oak woodlands and the yew woodlands that you'd find over by Killarney. So, um, and this then is a list of the species that are present in the SAC, and there's 12 of them listed here. Um, so some of them, like the Kerry slug, um, I suppose Ireland is a real stronghold for that particular species. Um, the freshwater pearl mussel, which is very, very endangered and is quite threatened. So um, we had our own Kerry Life project here for it, and there's now, it has its own um, European Innovation Partnership project as well. Um, and then there's the freshwater species like lamprey and salmon and otter, and also some plants like the Killarney fern and the slender naiad. There, just to give you an idea of the species for which the site is designated. Um, but what we're going to look at tonight mostly is the peatland habitats. Um, so peat, peatland habitats are really considered to be wetland habitats. So um, they get most of, they get, well, they get all of their water really from their rain fed. So rather than getting it from below ground, they get most of the water from, from the rain. So Peat is basically plant material that has built up over thousands of years. And because these habitats are very acidic and, very, and waterlogged, the plant material hasn't, hasn't broken down properly. So instead of getting, getting full um, decomposition and getting soil, what you end up is with peat, it, you end up with peat instead. So what we have here, the dry heath tends to be on, on the wet heath tend to be on shallower peat depths. 
on the blanket bog. So they're often on peat depths of less than about a half a metre. The dry heat tends to be more free draining, so it can dry out quite a lot during the summertime, whereas the wet heath and the blanket bog are generally wet throughout the year. And then the alpine and the subalpine heaths are usually up on the higher ground. Um, often the plants have a stunted growth because they're exposed to high winds and more snowfall. Um, and and they're, they're gener yeah, they're generally the plants are quite low growing in, in that area. So, um, but they all have a lot of species in common. There's overlaps and then certain species are more common in one habitat than, than another. Um, so this is a picture here. Um, it's a, map, a picture actually that we got from the Irish Peatland Conservation Council. Um, and it just shows the, the general distribution of raised bog and blanket bog in Ireland. So the raised bog is in the centre there and the blanket bog extends down the west coast. Um, now the difference between raised bog, bog and blanket bog is in the way that they're formed, but we're going to concentrate on the blanket bog tonight because that's what we have here in, in the Reeks area. Um, so just to say um, peatland habitats are, are I suppose, uh, very important habitats for biodiversity and blanket bog in particular is a very rare habitat. Um, Ireland, it said, is to has estimated to have about 8% of the world's blanket bog. Um, and I suppose when I looked at this map, I was quite amazed because if you think about Ireland and what a small landmass it is relative to the rest of the world, and then you think that we have 8% of the world's blanket bog um, and how much of, of, our, of our landmass that it's actually covering, then you can see that this is really, really very rare habitat. Um, so, and a lot of the, the plants and animals then that are associated with it, it's, it's really, really important that we do try and conserve these and protect these in terms of global biodiversity. So, um, one of the most important species for, for, for peat formation and the development of the heath and bog habitats is, is a, well, a group of mosses, a group of species called sphagnum mosses. Um, I'm going to show you a picture of them now in a few minutes, but Basically, just to say, these sphagnum mosses are really, really good at holding water. So they're a little bit like a sponge and they can hold up to 20 times their own weight in water. They also um, make the, their environment quite acidic um, and they actually they secrete a chemical which um, kind of inhibits anti, or antimicrobial or inhibits microbial um, action so that that generally bacteria and fungi don't work so well don't work so well which is why you don't get proper breakdown into soil so if you went back about 5000 years ago um, a lot of ireland was covered in trees um, and as the first farmers settled they began clearing woodlands for livestock and around about the same time there were changes in the climatic conditions um, we got a lot more rainfall um, over 200 millimeters a year but even in the west of ireland higher than that um, and these high rainfall led to iron being leached out of the uppermost layers of the soil. Um, and basically, as the trees are being cut down and the iron was getting washed out of the soil, then it, it, it sank down and formed an iron pan layer. Now, an iron pan layer is impermeable to water. So what happened then was as the rain continued to fall, the water levels began to rise. Um, and basically, you ended up with these kind of water logged conditions. And they were the perfect condition for sphagnum moss species to grow. So as more and more land was cleared and as the rain continued to fall, that continuous water log conditions allowed the sphagnum to spread out and basically like a mountain over the, over the or like a blanket over the mountainside. So that eventually we ended up with our, 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 our peatland habitats, our blanket bog, and um, also the kind of wet heath and dry heath habitats. Um, so, they estimate that the sphagnum species, they might grow between 2 and 12 centimetres a year, but the rate that peat actually accumulates is between, estimated to be between half a millimetre and a millimetre a year. So it's really, really tiny amounts. So peatlands are generally, they're actively growing if they're in good condition. They're, they're accumulating peat all the time. So um, if you look at this picture, and it's hard to tell from the picture, but these peat tags here were over six feet high. So if you think about how slow growing the, the bogs are, you can then think how many thousands of years it would have taken for the, this depth of peat to develop. So they really, really are, um, as I said, they're really, really 
some of the rare habitats, very rare habitats, and obviously because it takes such a long term to long time to recover, it's really, really important that we protect what we have. Um, so just to have a look then at some of the different plants um, that we would find in the heath and the bog habitats. Um, these habitats are often characterized by what we call dwarf shrubs because they're quite low growing. They might only grow waist high, kind of or lower. So just a few of them that we would get would be the bilberry and the heathers and the, the gorse, um, certain, the western gorse, there's two types. Um, one is kind of characteristic of peatland and the other not. So if you look there, we've got the bilberry, often to find that on the kind of drier heath habitats. Um, it gets the little black berries that you can see there um, that are really good for food for birds and also the flowers would be a good source of nectar. So those berries um, are like tiny blueberries really. You can eat them, they're, they're, they're tasty enough. So, um, and they're, um, I suppose they're really, they're really high in antioxidants and things like that as well. Um, and they're apparently very good for night vision. So uh, apparently they gave them to fighter pilots during the war to improve their night vision. So that would be one of the plants that you would get. Another one would be the bog cotton there, uh, which has those big white fluffy seed heads. Um, the, you get a couple of different species of bog cotton and they tend to be found more in the wet heath and the, the bog habitats as opposed to the dry heath. And then you get your heathers, so the ling heather there and the bell heather. Again, they're really, really good sources of um, nectar for insects and pollinators. And they, they tend to flower kind of late summer, autumn when other flowers may not be around. So, um, the, the ling heather is found, can be found in all the dry heath, the wet heath and the bog. And so sometimes it can be in quite dry conditions in the dry heath in the summer because it's so free draining, it can be dry enough. Other times it can be submerged on, in water to, um, you know, its roots can be submerged in water. So it has to adapt to, the, to those changes in its environment. So to do that, it has a very kind of waxy rolled leaves that help it to conserve moisture. Um, and it also has kind of fungus and things associated with the mi mycorrhizae they're called associated with its roots to help it extract minerals. Um, then we have the bell heather similarly, it would ha have kind of tight and rolled leaves for conserving, um, for conserving moisture. Um, and cross leaved teeth, which you tend to find in the wet habitat and in the bog. And then bog asphodel will be one of the, the plants that you'd find. It's quite distinctive, um, those beautiful yellow flowers. Um, the seed heads turn a kind of an orangey colour in the late summer and the autumn, so it's quite a distinctive one if you see it around. Um, we also get some carnivorous plants. Um, this is a sundew. Um, we get a few different types of sundew. Um, and sundews, basically, because these are nutrient poor habitats, the sundew is a carnivorous plant that's adapted to get extra nutrients from its environment by capturing insects. So if you look, it's got these kind of um, spoon shaped leaves and with what look like sticky hair is there and little droplets of water to an insect that looks like nectar, but it's actually a sticky substance that the plant secretes. And what happens is when the insect flies in, um, the, it gets stuck then in the sticky substance and then the plant kind of enrolls its leaves a little bit. It secretes kind of digestive juices to break down the insect and um, after about 24 hours it might open back up and what would remain really is the hard bits of the insect like the legs or the wings and things. So uh, it's estimated that a plant like this eats maybe up to five insects a month so not a lot but enough for it to get extra nutrients from, from the habitat. Um, this is another carnivorous plant that we get, the butterwort. Um, again you get a, a few different species of butterwort um, but again it has sticky leaves and insects get trapped on the leaves and then the leaves kind of roll inwards and it, it secretes juices and digests the insects again. It has lovely kind of purpley blue flowers that usually grow from a single stalk at the centre of the plant. So in the summertime that's quite distinctive but the, you can see the leaves all year round and they're, they're, they stand out themselves. So that's the butterwort. Um, this here then is a picture in the centre of some sphagnum moss. So as I said, there's a few different species of sphagnum moss um, and they come in different colours. So uh, there's red ones, kind of orangey ones, brown ones, green ones. So this would be an example of the sphagnum moss growing here with the bilberry around it. Um, there is some, some bell heather there and some, some ling heather as well as some kind of sedges and grasses and other 
other species growing in there. So that's just a, a, a typical example of what you'd see. Um, uh, this then is another upland moss that we would see a lot of, um, Rachometria moss. Um, and often it can cover over boulders and things like that, or rocks really. Um, so it's quite distinctive, it stands out. It all, often looks like a kind of a nice cushion to sit on if, it was, if it's dry. So, um, but it's quite a distinctive moss for the upland habitats. Um, and lichens, we get these bushy lichens as well growing up in the peatlands. And you get lichens in lots of different habitats and there's lots of different species of lichen. Um, lichens are actually two organisms living together. So they're made up of fungus and an algae. Um, and they have what's called a symbiotic relationship. So they each give each other something useful. So the, the fungus provides a kind of a structure and a place for the algae to live. And then the algae uses the sun's energy to make, make sugars and give some of, that, some of those sugars to the fungus. Um, lichens in general are often used to measure air quality. They're, they're very sensitive to air pollution. You get different types. You get crusty ones that, that are kind of crusted onto rocks. You get more leaf, leafy looking ones. And then you get these branched ones that you can see in the picture here. Um, the branched ones in particular are much more sensitive to pollution. So often if you're in a center of a, a, a big city, you won't find these branched lichens. You're more likely to see the crusty ones. Whereas if you're in somewhere that has really good air quality, which we have down here in Kerry, um, you'll see a lot of these growing around. So um, these are some of the ones you see in the uplands. You'll also see them hanging from trees and things in the national park as well. So, um, moving on. Just then to touch on some of the animals that we get in the, the peatland habitats. So the first one there is our, the red grouse. So red gr grouse are really confined to peatland habitats in that they feed almost exclusively on the heather. Um, now they need heather of different heights for, for, for them to have sufficient habitat to survive. So they need some tall heather for cover. They need, um, they need kind of more, some new growth for feeding on for their young and stuff. So, they, um, they, they really, really rely on the peatland habitats. Um, now, the, this is a bird that has declined, oh, estimated 70% in the last 50 years. Um, and I know a survey that was done in 2008 said there was between one and 5,000 pairs left breeding in the country. I'm not sure that may have been updated since, but that, that was recently. Um, so obviously this is, a, this is a bird that needs good peatland habitat for its survival. Um, Another species that we'd find commonly in the mountains would be the mountain hare. Um, our mountain hare is a little bit different to the mountain hare that you get in Scotland or in other parts of Europe. It's, it's a slightly different, sub, well, it's a different subspecies because it doesn't turn white in winter. If you went over to Scotland or um, you would, uh, the mountain hare there would turn white in winter and that's because they would have snow on their mountains for a lot longer, longer during the winter because and they're higher, and whereas here we only have snow for short periods, so it's more beneficial for the mountain hare to stay brown here. Whereas over in England or over in Scotland, it would be camouflaged by being white in the winter. So the mountain hare, as mountain hare in Ireland, has adapted to its kind of local environment. Um, another species that we get is the ring ousel, which is a really, really rare species. Um, in is our, our rarest thrush species. Um, it is still found in Donegal and there's some pairs left here in the McGillicuddy Reeks. Um, now, there has been large declines in the ring ousel across England and Ireland um, and I don't think it's fully understood that the whole reason behind it, although habitat changes are thought to be part of it. So in the McGillicuddy Reeks, I think back in 2011, it was estimated there was about nine pairs Whereas now it's estimated to be close to two or three pairs left breeding here in the reeks. So a really, really rare bird um, here, here. And then I think there may be a bigger population up in, up in Donegal. So then we have the common frog, which is a common species found in, in, in grasslands and other areas as well. Um, but peatland habitats are really, really good for amphibians because they're nice wet habitats with pools where they can go to breed and lay frogs spawn. And, so, you know, there, there are common species that you would see in the peatland habitat. Um, then we have our Kerry slug. So Kerry slug is a very rare species. It's only found in Cork and Kerry and parts of northern Portugal and Spain. So that's pretty much its global distribution. 
Um, so Kerry is a real stronghold for this species. The Kerry slug tends to be active at dawn and dusk, so but on wet days you will see it often out in the mountains. Sometimes you can just see it around and it might be feeding on algae and things on the rocks. So um, another really rare species. Um, it's one of our annex species. So a few other species then that you would see. Um, we have our male smooth newt and our female smooth newt. They look slightly different. Um, the male smooth newt is a bit showier. So these are amphibians like um, like our like our frogs and the, like the frogs, they go to ponds to breed in the spring. Um, the male actually tends to do a kind of a courtship dance with the female on the bottom of the pond. Um, and he'll wave his tail around and things to try and attract her. They're a little bit different to frogs in, in the way that they lay their eggs. Instead of laying large clumps of spawn, the female actually goes around and lays individual eggs on a leaf and then she'll fold the leaf over to protect the egg. So slightly different in that way. Um, then the next species we have, which looks superficially like the, the newts, is the common lizard. But while the newts are amphibians and have that soft, moist skin, the, the lizard is a reptile and has more scaly skin. So the lizard that we get here in Ireland is um, what they call a viviparasite lizard. It gives birth to live young, which is slightly different as most reptiles usually would lay eggs. So it's just a little bit different, um, but would be common enough across the peatland sites as well. Um, then bumblebees get a variety of different bee species and pollinators in general. Um, and there's one feed, feeding on the bell heather there. So um, again, the peatlands provide a really good source of nectar for them um, and lots of different species. And then another relatively common species that you find would be the dung beetle. Obviously, dung beetles again are found in different habitats and lots of different species, but they are really important in recycling nutrients. Um, They'll often roll big balls of dung and they will lay their eggs in it and then the larvae will hatch out and feed on the dung. Um, they apparently have a really, really good sense of smell. So um, sometimes what will happen is one dung beetle will roll a big ball of dung and another one will smell it and come and try and steal it from them. And you can, you can YouTube that. You'll often see videos of two dung beetles fighting over a pile of dung. And um, apparently they're very strong as well, that they can roll up to 10 times their own, their own weight. So. And dung. So just, just to give you an idea of some of the species. Okay, so, so moving on then, why are the McGillicuddy Reeks important? So, well, the habitats are obviously important for biodiversity. We've just gone through some of the different plants and animals that you'll find there. They're also important for clean water because when we've had heavy rain, um, they, will, they will kind of filter the water before it gets down to our rivers and streams. And um, so making sure that the water is cleaner reaching reaching our river streams, which is, has a, a knock-on impact then in terms of our fish life and our insect life within, the, within our fresh waters. Um, they can be important for flood prevention if they're in good condition because they can kind of slow the rate at which the water passes down through the hillsides and gets to the river and streams and then reducing any risks of flooding. Uh, they're important for climate change. They're a really, really important habitat in terms of storing carbon. Uh, it's Estimated, for example, in Ireland that peatlands maybe cover 60% of our land mass, but that they store over 50% of the carbon um, on the island. So, um, so they, they're really, really good at storing. At, I, they store large amounts of carbon, but they also keep it locked up for long periods of time. Um, they're important then for leisure and tourism um, and for farming in rural communities. They are actively farmed um, and a great resource for local people. So. Um, so every six years, in um, a member states have to report on the status of the annex habitats and the annex species um, on the island. So when they do this, they tend to look at the range for particularly for habitats. They look at the range in terms of the geographical range that the habitat is found and whether it's increasing or decreasing. They look at the area of the habitat then within the geographical range and if that's increasing or decreasing. Look at the structure and function, the condition of the habitat, and also the future prospects, any potential pressures or threats. So the last national assessment was done in 2019, and um, the dry heat, the wet heat, the alpine, subalpine heat, and upland blanket bogs were all found to have bad conservation status. So the prospects for it aren't, aren't great at the moment, and that's 
that's basically where our project is coming in. We're trying to work with um, landowners to try and improve the, the conservation status of these habitats. Um, so what we do is we tend to work with our participant farmers to develop farm plans. Um, and usually the farm plans will focus on trying to get a good grazing regime and trying to identify supporting actions that we can do to improve the condition of the habitat. Um, so central to this will be our results-based habitat assessments. So what we do is every year we will walk the participants' lands and we will assess the condition of the habitat and give it a score. Um, the farmer then receives a, a payment based on the score. So the better, the better condition of the land, the higher the score and then the higher the payment. So the idea would be to incentivize, um, incentivize participants to try and improve the condition of their land. Um, so when we do this, we use a scorecard that we have um, and the scorecard is basically divided into two sections. So the first section looks at the ecological integrity of the site and the second section then looks at the threats and the future prospects. So when we're looking at the ecological integrity, we're basically walking the site, doing almost like a W or a zigzagging across the site and we're sampling a number of points along the way. And at each point then we're looking at things like the diversity of the species, um, how many species that would be typical of the habitat are present. And um, we're looking at the cover of mosses and lichens because they're so important in keeping the habitat wet. Um, and we're looking at things like the vegetation structure and um, the height of the vegetation, the, the variety of species growing, etc. And the, the cover of the dwarf shrubs. Um, these habitats are, are generally by definition have a certain percentage of dwarf shrubs. So the percentage cover is important. And we're looking at the grazing level as well. So um, grazing on things like the heather and the grasses and the rushes and things. Um, then for the second section, we would be looking at the threats and the future prospects. So this is usually done more on a site level um, and be looking at maybe the percentage cover of negative indicators across the site. So a lot of, in a lot of cases, this tends to be bracken um, that we've come across. Um, we also look at the cover of non-native species across the site, like rhododendron and conifer trees. Um, we look at the condition of the soil, if there's uh, bare areas maybe that have been damaged by machinery or for other reasons. Um, we look at hydrological integrity, whether there's drains present, if they're active or if they're just old historic drains or if there's no drains present at all. Um, because as I said, the, the hydrology of these sites is really, really important. Um, we look at evidence of uncontrolled burning. If there's been burning that's taken place in the past that's been damaging, um, we, we take that into consideration. Um, and any particular damage due to supplementary feeding, um, if, our, if feeding has been done in the same spot and has created areas of bare ground. Um, Turbury, if there's been any active peak cutting, and then other damaging activities like dumping and pollution and things like that. So they're all the kind of things that we take into account when we're um, assessing each parcel of land. Um, so when we're looking at the ecological integrity, we're often looking at it in terms of having a healthy shrub, herb and moss layer. Um, now the two pictures here shows you one had kind of degraded peatland and then the other was a healthy peatland. Um, now these are the two extremes, so obviously the healthy peatland is all layers present and looks great. The degraded peatland here is, is very degraded. You can see the shrub layer is almost gone, the, her the herb layer um, and moss layer, the, there's not much layer. So this, this the degraded peatland is the soil is eroding here. It's, it's lost that sphagnum layer that helps to build up the, the peat. So it's not actively sequestering carbon anymore. Um, and it's not providing habitat for the plants and animals that you would typically expect to find here. So, um, so that, that's basically what we're tend to take into consideration when we're looking. Now there's lot, these are the two extremes. So there's lots of variations in between these two extremes. And there's lots of reasons for the variations. It might be to do with grazing, it might be to do with historical burning or drainage, etc. But these are the think type of things that we'd be looking at. Um, so then just to say a little bit about grazing. Um, grazing plays an important role in keeping the balance in these peatlands. So, um, and I suppose um, a number of different factors can affect the, gra can affect the grazing as well. But if there's very high levels of grazing, what you tend to find is 
that leads to the loss of your dwarf shrubs and that grasses tend to become dominant. Um, if there is very low grazing, then in certain cases, trees and shrubs can in, invade and the habitat can dry out a bit. So trying to get a balance in the grazing is really important. A number of different factors will affect the grazing, the type of grazer, the duration of grazing, um, the timing of grazing and, lot, and lots of other practices like herding and, and supplementary feeding sectors can all have, play, play a role in, on, in terms of the effect in graze, uh, of grazing animals on the habitat. Um, grazing all grazers, really all animals, are to some extent selective in what they eat. Um, they're going to eat their favourite things first and then the less favourable things are going to be left to last or they mightn't be eaten at all. So the, the types of animals used will have an impact on the structure of the vegetation and also on um, the species composition, what species you actually find there. So um, this one here now would be a picture of um, a site that's been heavily sheep grazed. So if you look in the centre there where it looks quite bare, there's actually a lot of heather growing in there, but it's really, really tiny. It's been, the sheep have been preferentially grazing on the heather. It's been grazed to a really low level, so it's not getting a chance to flower. Um, and because they've been concentrating in and around the heather, um, the ground has gotten a bit poached, so there's been damage then to the moss layer and things like that. So often our, our, our farmers, our participants would ask us, is the site overgrazed or undergrazed? And I suppose we'd often say to them, we don't want you to think just purely as it's overgrazed or undergrazed, but rather think more about getting the balance of species right. So from, from looking at this photograph, you'd think the heather definitely is overgrazed. From an ecological perspective, we'd like to see it getting a chance to flower and to provide habitat. Um, the grass in the background, which you call purple moor grass or locally known as fanon, um, that might actually do with a bit of a graze. So it's all about getting the balance right. Um, so what we would like to do is here is to, prob is to bring in some cattle maybe to graze on the phenom, but to reduce the sheep grazing so that the heather gets a chance to recover. Because sheep tend to be quite selective grazers and they can crop the vegetation very, very close, um, so quite short. Um, whereas cattle are generally less selective and um, they will tend, rather than the sheep tend to bite with their front incisors, cattle will use their tongue and wrap it around vegetation and pull it. So and they also have a much larger gut, so they can digest less palatable species that sh sheep would find difficult to feed on. So this purple moor grass here, um, sheep may feed on it in kind of May, June when it's nice fresh growth, but a lot of the year it's, it, they'd find it quite tough and they tend to focus on other species, whereas the cattle could manage this, manage that more easily because they can digest those less palatable species more easily. So it's not so much, it's, it's more about getting the balance of species right is what we're trying to aim for. And what we don't really want to happen maybe is an example like this where the phenon or the purple moor grass becomes really, really dominant at the, at the extent of the, the heathers and things, because particularly there where the heather is being heavily grazed and suppressed, then it, the phenon has a greater chance to expand and take over. So it's all about trying to get a balance. Um, this here is some of the cattle that some of our participant farmers introduced this year. These are Drummond cattle that they brought in to graze on, on the phenon grass. Um, these sites, these peatland sites, they generally need quite low levels of grazing. So we don't, and usually summer grazing is best, so we're not looking for farmers to bring in large numbers of cattle. We, we just want kind of light grazing. So what we're tending to do is rather than encouraging farmers to go out and buy cattle in an area that's been largely sheep farmed, we're looking more at a B&B &B system where farmers um, can borrow in cattle for a couple of months, just do the light grazing that they need and then return them, which basically means that they're not stuck with somewhere to put them during the winter time and that the, the sites aren't grazed too heavily. So we just want them to come in, do a light grazing, do the job that they need to do, and then, then take them off again. So, um, so, and this generally will suit a lot of farmers because then they don't have to house them during the winter time. So this is some drum and cattle. The drum and cattle are some of the kind of more hardy breeds. Um, we'd also be looking at Dexters and Kerry cattle as well. Um, and I guess they, they tend to deal with the vegetation more easily to digest it. They're also a kind of a, a lower stockier breed um, and they tend to manage the mountain terrain better as well. So that's some of the cattle.
Um, this is an example of one site that we'd say is in really, really good ecological condition. Um, you can see the heather there is in full bloom. Um, the sphagnum moss then at the front, you can see it's a really good cover right throughout the site. Um, the purple moorgrass in there as well, but it's not dominant in any way. Um, so this will be a site that is in really, really good ecological condition. Now, we are also conscious of keeping the, the sites um, grazable for livestock as well and getting that balance right. So if there are situations where it's, it, the heather is starting to become degenerate, then we would look at certain methods of managing that as well for the farmers. So, um, and then just to say a little bit about burning. Um, burning has been used as a management tool for years. Um, it's, I suppose it's generally been used where heather has become old or degenerate or where um, firs or gorse has become very dense or, or where the purple moorgrass has become very dominant. Um, and it, it, is a, it is a quick way of managing those and, um, and um, I suppose bringing back, or bringing back that new growth. The only thing is burning, if not done properly, it can have really detrimental uh, impact on these peatland habitats. So this here is an example of two sites that have had bad burns in the past. And if you look, you can see that the, the dwarf shrubs are actually coming back quite well, but the moss layer hasn't recovered. And that moss layer is so important for continuous peat formation. So if that isn't there, then the peatland isn't actively growing anymore. So rather than being a carbon sink, it's acting as a carbon source and water runs off more quickly so, and leads to erosion. So it's really, really important if burning is to be used that it's done on sites where it's suitable to burn for one and also that the burn is managed in terms of the time of year that it's carried out, in terms of the extent of the burn and in terms of the intensity of the burn because what you want to do is get is a really, really light burn that goes across and burns the surface vegetation but doesn't doesn't destroy that ground layer. Um, so while it is you can be used as a tool, it, it can also be very damaging and it's trying to trying to get the balance right there. Um, we would try, we're hoping to do some training for some of our farmers on a side or two, but to be honest, most of the sites that we have seen haven't really needed needed a burn. Um, there's only been a few that you might might have considered it on. So and it's just making sure that if you do do it, that it's done in the right way. Um, so one of the, a big threat, I suppose, to the peatland habitats is the invasion of bracken. So bracken is a native species. It is found, in, it would be found naturally in woodlands and it is also found in peatlands, but in certain situations it can, it can take over um, and can spread. And because it grows quite tall, what it actually does is it shades out the native vegetation underneath. So it shades out the the shrubs and the herbs and the moss layer underneath. And then over time you end up with dense brock, bracken fronds and bracken litter underneath and not much else growing there. So if bracken becomes quite extensive over a peatland, then what you're doing is you're, it's resulting in the loss of habitat really. So one of the things we're doing is we're working with our farmers to try and manage bracken where, it's, where it has become a problem and it's become quite extensive. Um, and we're doing this in a few different ways. We are, doing some spraying, we are trampling with cattle and we're cutting. So the actual method that we employ depends on the site. Each site is different really and it depends what's the suitable option for that site. Um, but we are trying to help farmers pure, to, to restore the peatland habitat and also to provide better grazing ground for the farmers as well. Um, so another, so this, well, this is an example of a, the same site I showed you earlier that it had a heavy sheep grazing. So again, here you can see in the foreground there, the heather has been grazed to quite a low level and um, the purple moorgrass at the back there is still quite high. And um, so the sheep have been concentrating in around the, the heather and the ground has become disturbed a bit and the, the sphagnum layer has been disturbed. And what you're getting then creeping in is the bracken. So where the ground has been dried out and the sphagnum layer has been lost or where dwarf shrubs are kept at a low level, it's just providing opportunities for bracken to come in. So, um, so that's basically managing the grazing regime can also help stop the spread of some of these species as well. So, um, so another, another species that is, is a threat really to the peatland habitats is the rhododendron. 
Um, now, rhododendron is a non-native invasive species. So non-native means that it didn't get here um, naturally, it was brought in by people. Um, and invasive means that it, it can spread and take over large areas. So um, rhododendron is originally from Eastern Europe, around the Black Sea area and parts of Portugal and Spain. Um, and it was brought into the UK and then onto Ireland around the 1700s. And it was brought over um, as a garden plant because it has these beautiful purple flowers. Um, but it, it can, in certain situations, it can be invasive and it does take over areas of woodland and peatland. Um, so again, we're working with our farmers to try and manage this. It's very targeted stem treatment that we do. Um, and this species, if you have a small amount of it, it's very, it can be very easy for a farmer on his own to, to manage it or her own. Um, but if, it's, if there's a large amount of it, which in many of, the, many of our sites it is starting to spread, then it would be a really, really daunting task to, to tackle this on your own. Um, so what we've done is we've set up a kind of collective group, um, which is made up of local farmers or lo members of the local community, um, so that the farmer can work with the collective group or, or bring the collective group, group in to do the work on their behalf um, to try and manage this try and manage the rhododendron because it's much, much easier and you make much greater progress, progress with a group of people. So, um, so that's basically the kind of work that we're doing. Um, so thank you for listening. And if any, anybody has any questions or anything, you can let me know. Thanks, Mary. That was great. Um, I was just uh, <coughs> saying to Trish there in a message, I was like, every time I listen to your talk, I learn so much stuff. So <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Great. Thanks, <laughs> Eller. <laughs> I'm always like, oh, there's new facts about the plants that I missed that I pick up the next time I hear you. So really, really good. And um, we've had a few questions come in there and I'll just go over them again. I see uh, Trisha has been answering them in the background. Um, but just if you could answer them as well. Would the yeah. Killarney shad be regarded as an annex species? The Killarney, which? The Killarney fern, is it? Or? No, no, the Killarney. Oh, the Clarny Nyad. Um, yes, I think that is an onyx species. Yeah, it is. Yeah. The shed is, so I just put in a link there. Oh, the Clarny Shad. Oh, the fish the shed. shed. But you were saying the Nyad. Um, yes, that is as well. So, yeah. Yeah. So I sent a link there to the, um, I think it was Dearman that asked that question. So I just uh, jumped in there with a link to NPWS, a really good um, document, actually, a really good PDF. And it shows um, a little bit of background on all of the species, actually. So, anyway. Mm -hmm. To get in depth information, that is definitely the link to go into there. Great. Great stuff. And then there's a, another one about the bracken that I think you've, you've probably covered in your talk anyway. But why is the bracken considered to be a negative indicator and, on your, your farm assessments? Yeah, well, I suppose because it, 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 it can take over and shade out the habitats and then it really re results in the loss of the peatlands over time. So um, if, if we want to protect the peatland habitats, if that's our objective, then we need to manage the bracken where, where it's becoming invasive, not, not necessarily everywhere that is small. Fantastic. And we have a couple more questions coming in there. Um, here we go. Noticed a lot of diggers or bulldozers being brought in to flatten and clear land to dig drains around here in Cahar Daniel. Um, would you have any comments on that? Is that considered a good practice? Um, well, I can't comment on that particular example, but I mean, in general, drainage isn't good for peatland habitats because they are wetland habitats. And if you're draining them, you're drying them out and you're going to stop continuous kind of peat accumulating. So if they're, if they're kept wet and waterlogged, then they're going to actively grow if they have the sphagnum moss. If they're drained and they dry out, then that formation is going to stop. So generally not a good habit. Um, and then, so another question here about the project. How were the farmers approached to participate? And what do you think needs to change to get more involved? I think there's, that's two questions there, I think, if you want to take them. <laughs> do you want me to answer that, Trish, or do you want to jump in there? Um, oh, and yeah, I can answer it. Um, so, yeah, it, the project actually was open to all farmers in the McGillicuddy-Reeks area there in the map that Mary showed earlier. Um, so every farm that was wide open to any farmer at all who wanted to, to apply to become part of it. So the farmers just had to complete a simple expression of interest form. And for every single farmer, and we had quite a lot of farmers, we had a, 
I think 60 individual farmers and over 18 colleges applied to become part of the project. Um, so um, we walked all of their land. We said we would. <laughs> so off. we were very, very busy at the start of the project, doing a lot of walking over the course of a few months of the winter to look at the land and see what the issues were on the land. And that formed the basis then. Um, how to get more farmers involved? Well, I suppose that is, it's a long and a short answer. It's very easy to get the farmers involved because the farmers are willing to become involved. The big challenge I suppose we have is that it's a pilot project. Uh, it's only a very small project with a very small um, budget. So if we had more budget and if we had a longer time frame, most certainly we could bring in more farmers. So I suppose that's a, <laughs> a very political answer to give the reality of it. So another one in from Ashling Kenny. Do you know if the forestry programme in Ireland is likely to end up planting in areas like this? So do you think there's ever going to be forestry planted in the REITs area where you're working? Um, for sure, no, but I, I, it is a special area of conservation. So um, any changes to, to the habitat have to go through what's called an appropriate assessment if it's not for the benefit of the management of the site. So um, probably not within the SAC unless it's considered to be something that would be beneficial. Um, I imagine in, in other areas there will be some forestry plantations. Um, it, it would depend on site by site basis. Um, I mean, there may be areas that have, have, are particularly dry or drier that have been lost to bracken and maybe people will consider a native planting or it could be commercial planting depending on what the application is. But, but I imagine the SAC as it stands at the moment, I can't see there being huge amounts of forestry plantations. Will you be publishing best management practices for managing land and improving habitats as part of the project work? Um, we, you want to take this, Mary? Well, we'll certainly be promoting our findings. I think, um, you know, um, at the moment, we're still pretty much in the early stages of, of the practices. Um, this was our first year of actively getting all the farmers involved in carrying out the action. So, um, yes, I imagine any learnings that we have, we will promote them. So, and publish any guidance that we can. And there's a lot coming as well I suppose from um, a lot of the other projects as well, a lot of the other EAPs for example the Hin Harrier project now will give a series of videos out at the moment. Um, we have done a little bit of best practice I suppose on the rhododendron and the rhododendron treatment so we had a webinar there um, I think it was a fortnight ago so that can be found on the YouTube channel I think you'll probably cover that for Zee and Delner. So for anyone wanting to see how things like that, uh, the invasive species are treated you know, we'll be producing as we go along, I suppose, uh, because a bit like Mary said, each site is different. Um, so it's kind of it's very hard to do a, a one-fits-all approach. Um, but um, definitely a lot of the other projects are producing very good um, materials there and best practice as well. So keep an eye on all of them. <laughs> that, lots to do in a short space of time for the project, I think. So it's, it's hard to tip all of these. Um, another question then about the project. Is the funding for the project coming from the EU or the Irish government and how long has the project been in existence and how much longer is it going to be continuing? Okay, so the project is a European Innovation Partnership project. So as you, as Mary, I think, said at the start, there's 23 of those projects up and down the country. Uh, there's a number of them for the upland areas. It's funded by the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine, and that's coming from the Rural Development Programme 2014 to 2020. So it's both the Department of Agriculture and European funding. Um, how long the project has been in existence? We started back in the middle, end court side of 2018, and we're due to finish at the end of 2022. So short enough time, really. Let me stop. Uh, another question here now about the future of farming in the Reeks. So given the access to markets abroad, is there a future of farming in the Reeks, given the access to markets abroad, or will supply of product become more local as this is much more circular? Um. I suppose, to answer Vinny's question, it, is, it will depend on policy, like policy will, I suppose, be the maker or the breaker of this, and I know this is something that um, Minister Pippa Hackett, the Minister for State for uh, Biodiversity and Land Use, covered a little bit on our webinar the other night, um, and she did talk about the more secular economy where you would actually value the produce, because um, that does make more sense, obviously, to be buying local produce and trying to support that, but then people will have to be willing to pay a little bit more. Um, so is there, farming, is there a future of farming in the Reeks at the moment? Um, well, I suppose the farmers would feel themselves that there's very few young farmers getting involved in farming as well. So that's a huge challenge. 
um, to encourage young farmers to become involved in it. And again, it probably is, like I said, a lot of policies have to change to, to help um, create a market for produce. That's a challenge. chat box here. Do you think the proposed cap reform focuses enough on biodiversity friendly farming and if not do you expect it to make your work a little harder? <laughs> That's a big question Julie, thank you big, so big much. Big question there. <laughs> so we have been told by the Department of Agriculture that they are going to be speaking to us and they're going to be speaking to all of these uh, locally led agri-environmental projects, these European Innovation Partnership projects to feed into the next round of the cap because we haven't had a, an opportunity yet. I think they're getting quite excited about the results-based um, incentivized scheme that Mary talked about in terms of improving the condition of the habitats. Um, but I suppose we don't know yet enough about the proposed cap ourselves, because it is still you know, being discussed at the moment. Um, always, I think you could put more focus on biodiversity-friendly farming, you know, and I think there are a lot of strategies, the farm to fork strategy, the biodiversity strategy, there's a lot coming out, um, but whether we will be able to take that on board then, because this, this time round for CAP, it will be the governments themselves that will be responsible for how those policies are actually implemented in their own countries. Yeah. It will go down to, I suppose, what the public want, uh, do the public have an appetite for this change, and will we be able to um, I suppose balance food production and biodiversity and environmental outputs you know together. And I think as well what we'd like to see projects is that the, the kind of land management function of the farmers is recognised as well that is particularly in these kind of um, I suppose lower productive lands where there's lower productivity that it's not just about the economic value of the stock but also about the land management role that they play in managing the habitats and things as well so answered all the questions we just had a few messages come in there thank you for the webinar um really interesting as i said before uh, so thanks so much mary for putting it together uh, i think mary's had a bit of a cold the last few days as well so a special thanks to powering <laughs> through with the with the sore head and everything um just to let everyone know about a few events that we have coming up uh, next week and the week after as part of the our planet your biosphere program Next week, we will be joining Mary Sheehan, who is one of the NPWS rangers working in Clarny National Park, and she'll be talking about the habitats and species of the National Park that would be the designated um, or the protected habitats and species. So to go through those in a little bit more detail and give everyone a bit of an introduction to them. And running at the moment as well, we also have our Storyscapes project, which is an arts installation and storytelling project with artist and storyteller Sean O'Leary. Now he's based down in Port McGee, but it's relevant to everyone everywhere. So follow us on Facebook or follow Sean and Shana Key on Facebook and you'll see the in instructions there. You'll be watching some videos and giving us your, your observations or opinions on how the story should go and what should happen next. And the final um, story then will be told on the 21st of November and that will be the final event of the whole series. So we hope to see some of you there. Um, we have got one more question popped in here now while I was talking. So when was the last sighting of a ring oozel? Yeah, so I was just actually in the middle of answering that so I can <laughs> <laughs> So as far as I know, um, there is actually no um, monitoring, actually official monitoring would say taking place of the ring oozel. So there's a lot of um, anecdotal evidence. And I know Dr. Alan Mee has done a little bit of research and we know that the ring oozel is in decline in the area. Um, but um, I don't think there's actually any would say active research been undertaken. That yeah, I think there was there was some survey work done some, mm -hmm. or between 2017 and 18 that there was two or three pairs left. I'm not sure what the the current situation is since then, but I imagine still a couple of pairs hanging around. So. Um, Vincent, Vincent Highland has said there's been sightings here in the mountains behind Cara Daniels, so maybe maybe come down this well, direction, <laughs> <laughs> try and find some of them. <laughs> Lovely stuff. So I think that is all of the questions that we have for this evening. And um, thanks so much to everyone for joining us. Um, I think we'll leave it there now. I suppose it's, it's getting on later, later in the evening. It's nice to finish up and relax. And thanks so much, Mary, for taking the time to share all that information with us and to Patricia for joining us to share some information about the project as well.
there's a few thank yous popping in there from David and Ashling. Thanks very much for listening. Um, and have a nice evening. And we hope to see you again next week for the talk about the habitats and species in Clarny National Park. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks, everybody, for listening.